the summer of 2010, I had an internship with an AIDS organization in Taiwan. And my first project was dealing with the travel bans that Taiwan and many other countries impose upon people that are HIV positive. And dealing with these bans really taught me that our understanding of HIV comes in a lot of ways. It's influenced by the representations that we've created about people that are HIV positive. Because these bans are not based on science. There's no evidence that they do anything to stop the spread of HIV. They're based on fear and a particularly distorted fantasy about the people that they're imposed upon. They hurt people for no reason. So working with this organization really taught me that if we ignore the experience of people living with HIV, then all our passion to stop its spread will only stigmatize the disease, which I feel this image is a good example of. It comes from a French NGO, and it's an ad warning people to have safe and responsible sex. But I want you to think about this from an HIV-positive perspective for a second, especially since the text at the bottom reads, without a condom, you're sleeping with AIDS. According to this ad, having HIV makes you AIDS. You're not a human. You're a disease, a malicious scorpion. And I obviously agree that spreading knowledge and awareness about HIV is important. It's the reason I'm here today. But I do not believe that this is a message that we can spread by subjecting people living with HIV to a dehumanizing portrayal of themselves, a portrayal that says in a lot of ways that they're the ones with the problem. A lot of what I'm speaking about today is related to the ways that we've invested HIV with certain meanings, which comes by way of the work of Susan Sontag, who's written about the ways we use metaphor to understand and discuss disease. And she writes that part of the reason that we do this is because we desire a separation between ourselves and the danger, the mortality that we see in disease. But these metaphors, these systems of significance, work another function with HIV as well, because it isn't just a dangerous disease. It's also morally charged. The main routes of transmission evoke images of deviance and depravity. We think of dirty needles and unprotected sex. And if we acknowledge our association with HIV, then we concede, too, that we have a relationship with these things that we don't want to be a part of us, because we want to think of ourselves as good or pure people. So again, we desire separation. And by the magic of metaphor, we achieve that. But we achieve it by projecting that danger, that evil, elsewhere. Which means there's another side of the story. Because when we separate ourselves from disease, we also alienate those who have it. If all we see when we think about HIV is heathens and junkies, pain and suffering, then we create barriers between ourselves and those living with it as well. Which makes it possible to objectify them. And once they're so fundamentally different from us that they're hardly human, they become untouchable. Their very presence is dangerous. The image on the right speaks to that. It was made in the late 80s when a 13-year-old boy was kicked out of school for being HIV positive. And I think that one of the problems that we have in trying to overcome these barriers is that we've been trained to locate HIV in the bodies of those who have it. It's tempting to think of HIV in terms of risk groups. So in the early days of the epidemic, HIV was primarily seen as a problem of the four H groups, which was first homosexuals and then included heroin users, hemophiliacs, and Haitians. And this had the convenient result of making HIV a disease of people that were already marginalized, people that it was easy to ignore. Things have changed since then, and now we use different sets of risk groups to uh, think about the disease. The ones I have up here are pretty typical, and they stand for intravenous drug users, men who have sex with men, and female sex workers. And perhaps this is a bit better. Certainly it's more neutral, more politically correct, but there's still a fundamental problem with our insistence on thinking of HIV in terms of risk groups, because it perpetuates this assumption that it's only of concern to certain people. So if you're like me, a straight male who's never shot up, you can relax, because according to this logic, HIV still isn't your thing. But this is especially problematic because these risk groups aren't always so neutral or so abstract in saying who does and who doesn't have the disease. You'll find plenty of talk about the risk of HIV in black and Latino men and the prison population. Or in China, I would see many messages about the HIV risk in the countryside and among the labor migrant population especially. 
And one day in Taiwan, I was talking to my boss about this problem, the idea of race as a risk group, because I had seen these messages. You know, on the United States Center for Disease Control site, they list black and Latino men as a special topic for HIV. And the people that I was meeting in Taiwan, some were talking about the problem of HIV among foreigners. And we talked for a bit, and eventually my boss stops me and she says, you know, Matt, yeah, racism negatively affects the HIV epidemic. But I think you're missing something. Because you need to think, too, about the messages that these groups have received. Because they've always been told that they're more at risk for HIV than others. So they get tested at higher rates. And when you test at a higher rate than another group, you're finding more people within this group, whether it's foreign or gay, who, are, who have the disease, which feeds back into this assumption that it's their problem and not ours. It's a disease of blacks, not whites. For gays, not straights. For foreigners, not natives. And this, these two pictures that I have up here speak to these risk group assumptions pretty well, because they're the results that I got for pretty neutral Google searches. The one on the left was an image search for MSM, remember men who have sex with men, and HIV. And about half the results that came back were images of black men. The one on the right was a search on Taiwan's Google site using the terms HIV, Taiwan, and sex workers. And eight out of the 10 results that came back were articles about HIV and female sex workers from mainland China. So what I'm saying is that when we focus too much on trying to locate HIV, we distort the fundamental reality of the disease, the reality that it's something that we're all vulnerable to. And this is a problem, because somewhere between 20 and 25% of people that have HIV are unaware of their HIV status. And over the last 30 years, what we've learned more than anything is that it's ignorance that makes this disease deadly. It's ignorance that allows infection to continue, that prevents people from getting tested. People that know they have HIV make every effort to avoid giving that to somebody else. It's the assumption that you're safe that makes mistakes seem benign, that makes it OK to say, just this once. So our tendency to project difference upon HIV, to believe that it's a concern for some groups and not for others, that it's a concern for that abstract other who's gay or foreign or any other scorpion. This isn't only a problem because it alienates these people. It isn't only a problem because it stigmatizes the disease. It's an epidemiological concern as well. So really, what I think we all need to do, and what I challenge you to do today, is to make a commitment to make HIV your problem. Get tested. Everyone. The more people that get tested, the more impossible it is to maintain this fiction that HIV is a concern for some people and not for others. Testing creates solidarity around the disease. And by acknowledging that we're all vulnerable to HIV, that we all have a relationship to it, we stop thinking of HIV as a virus that we get from dangerous people or dirty places. And we unite to simply deal with it as the dangerous virus that it is. Thank you.